We've been slaying, looting, and clicking through Diablo's procedurally generated dungeons for over 25 years. The original Diablo birthed the action RPG genre, and it continued to hone that formula to become an absolutely giant franchise. To celebrate the launch of Diablo 4, here's a look back at the history of Diablo. The 1994 pitch for Diablo is really interesting to go back and read today. The document presented a game that's pretty similar to what we know of as Diablo now. From the beginning, it was always built with replayability in mind, with an emphasis on exploration and experimenting with the game's different classes. But there were key differences. Namely that Diablo was originally planned to be a turn-based game, with permadeath, and that it would be expanded by adding items and quests through expansion packs inspired by Magic the Gathering booster packs. This project was the baby of developer David Brevik and the team at Condor, but it wasn't in active development. Instead, they were working on Justice League Task Force for Sega. And at the CES trade show in 1994, they met the team from Silicon and Synapse, who were also working on Justice League Task Force, but this time for Nintendo. Neither developer knew about the other game, but they got to talking anyway. And the Silicon and Synapse devs revealed that they were itching to make their own fantasy PC games. They all agreed to keep in touch, and after Silicon and Synapse shipped a small game called Warcraft what? and changed their name to Blizzard, reps from the team came to visit Condor to check out Diablo. Blizzard offered Condor $300,000 to make Diablo, but it quickly became apparent that it wouldn't be enough. Condor landed a $1 million side gig to make a football title for the 3DO M2 console, and even though the M2 never released, 3DO offered to buy the small studio. This kicked off a bidding war between 3DO and Blizzard, with Condor eventually picking Team Blizzard because their cultures aligned more. In 1996, Condor became Blizzard North, and development on Diablo was full steam ahead. But Blizzard South had some ideas about the game, and urged North to make the game real-time instead of turn-based. Brevik, who was lead programmer, claimed that this would take a lot of work, and even got another milestone payment from Blizzard for the trouble. Turns out it was actually pretty easy to do, and Brevik ended up doing it in an afternoon. Diablo, enter if you dare. Diablo is often credited with being the first action RPG, and it launched alongside Battle.net, Blizzard's proprietary gaming platform that allows players to control their Blizzard games, connect with others, and play together. Diablo's gameplay loop of exploring procedurally generated dungeons, fighting monsters, and collecting loot proved to be an irresistible combination. Its three character classes, Warrior, Rogue, and Sorcerer, added even more variety, and the game could even be played online. Admittedly, rampant cheating was a huge issue, but when the game launched, it was a huge critical and commercial hit. On 9.6 out of 10 reviews stated that if you like PC games, you should go out right now and experience what is likely to be the clone maker for the next two years. Diablo is often cited as being one of the best PC games ever made, and a version was made for the PS1 by Climax and published by EA in 1998. Hot on the heels of the massive success of Diablo, the execs at Blizzard's parent company, Davidson & Associates, were pushing for more content. And despite Blizzard North's objections, another team owned by the conglomerate was given the task of making an expansion, and only six weeks in which to do it. After assurance that Blizzard North could executive produce the pack, representatives from the original team met with Synergistic Software to discuss the expansion and provide some guidance, as well as house rules. Blizzard North only allowed Synergistic Software to include one new character class and told them outright that they couldn't add to Diablo's multiplayer, because it would require a complete rebalancing of the online portion of the game. Luckily for the team at Synergistic Software, their deadline was extended to four months, and the expansion, Hellfire, launched in 1997. It added a new storyline, items, and improvements to the game's interface. True to their word, they only added one new character class, the Monk. However, there were two unfinished classes left in the game that could be accessed pretty easily by tweaking the command.txt file, the Bard and the Barbarian. Diablo 2 was released in 2000, and it was immediately clear that the sequel was bigger and more complex than the original. Exploration was no longer relegated to its dungeons. Diablo 2 had an overworld with more varied environments. Improvements were made to its storytelling. Crucially, quests were no longer random and instead linked together to tell a more cohesive tale across its four acts. 
At launch, there were five character classes instead of three. Amazon, Necromancer, Barbarian, Sorceress, and Paladin, and three difficulty levels. There's also a hardcore mode that introduces permadeath for your character. Diablo 2's quirkiest addition to the franchise is undoubtedly a hidden cow level. By transmuting specific items, a portal would appear that would take players to the secret cow level, which was filled with cows, led by the Cow King. The cow level goes back as early as the original Diablo, when an online hoax led people to believe that it existed in the original game. Synergenistic software threw a reference to it in the Hellfire expansion, accessed once again by tweaking the command.txt file. Diablo 2 was designed with much more emphasis on cooperative multiplayer, working to fix the cheating issues that plagued the original game by introducing open and closed realms. Although the cheating issues weren't solved entirely, there was definitely some improvement. There's also a ladder system for multiplayer, where characters would be reset at the end of a season to allow players to play on equal footing. Diablo 2 flew off the shelves when it launched in 2000, and despite being criticized for its dated graphics, it also reviewed pretty well. A remake, Diablo 2 Resurrected, was released in 2021 that updated the game's graphics. But if you yearn for that 2000s aesthetic, you could swap to the old style with the push of a button. A year after Diablo 2's launch, an expansion was released, this time developed by the original team at Blizzard North. On top of new items and gameplay mechanics like more control over hirelings, it added a fifth act to the game's story and a new demonic boss to battle, Baal. Lord of Destruction also added two new character classes, the Druid and the Assassin. We gave it an 8.2, with reviewer Greg Kasavin saying that the expansion offers plenty of new features, enough to make you spend at least as much time with the expansion as you have with the original game. You cannot judge me. I am justice itself. We were meant for more than this. To protect the innocent. After the enormous success of Diablo 2, the team at Blizzard North began work on Diablo 3. Speaking to IGN, Blizzard North co-founder Eric Schaefer revealed that it was a vastly different game. It was a true MMO with a stronger faction and PvP focus, but it was still in early development and really, I don't remember much about it. After some conflict with Blizzard's then-owner Vivendi, many key talent from Blizzard North, including David Brevik and the other co-founders, departed from the studio. Blizzard North's Diablo 3 was cancelled, and the studio closed down in 2005. Blizzard South in Irvine took the lead, with Fallout co-creator Leonard Boyarsky acting as the game's lead world designer, and Company of Heroes Jay Wilson as game director. Flash forward to 2008, and at the Blizzard Worldwide Invitational in Paris, Blizzard revealed Diablo 3 to the world. Set 20 years after the events of Diablo 2, Diablo 3 has you play as the Nephilim, offspring of a demon and angel, investigating a star that's fallen onto the cathedral near Tristram. Yes, the very same cathedral that once concealed Diablo's soulstone in the original game. Launching with five classes, with an additional two coming in later expansions, Diablo 3 was widely praised upon release for refining the franchise's compelling gameplay loop. Our reviewer Carolyn Pettit wrote, The controls are responsive and pleasurable. The diversity of character classes and skill customization options is impressive, and the constant stream of gold and treasure you earn is irresistible. Diablo has the recipe for crafting a habit-forming, loot-driven action RPG down to a science, and in Diablo 3, the results of that recipe are more exciting and more addictive than they've ever been. While the core gameplay was solid, Diablo 3's launch was nothing short of disastrous. The game requires players to be connected to the internet at all times, even when playing alone. At launch, when hundreds of thousands of players were eager to head back to Sanctuary, they were presented with the most horrifying thing imaginable. While the development team worked tirelessly to implement a fix to the servers, players review-bombed the game on Metacritic and lambasted the team on the official Blizzard forums. Even after the server issues were sorted, it wouldn't be the end of Diablo 3's woes, thanks to the implementation of its controversial Auction House, an online storefront where players could exchange in-game gold or real-world money for items. Blizzard's reasoning for including the Auction House was to legitimize third-party trading, to prevent players from being scammed by third-party sites. Unfortunately, it was met with a lot of criticism, because of course Blizzard were taking a cut. Players accused the game of having pay-to-win aspects, 
and the auction house was removed a couple of years later. For now, we want you to know that both the Real Money Auction House and the Gold Auction House will be shut down on March 18th, 2014. It actually took so long to be taken offline because Blizzard were concerned that they would open the company up to legal action because the auction house was listed as a feature on the back of the box. Despite some missteps, Diablo 3 would be an enormous success, and to celebrate its 10th anniversary, Blizzard revealed that the game had over 65 million players since launch. It came to PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 in 2013, PS4 and Xbox One the following year, and even to the Nintendo Switch in 2018. Diablo 3's console ports would be widely praised for managing to effectively translate the game's PC controls to controller. Diablo 3's first expansion, Reaper of Souls, was released in 2014. On top of adding new story content and quality of life updates, the expansion also added a number of gameplay features, including seasons, new dungeons called Nephilim Rifts, the Defensive Crusader class, and raised the level cap from 60 to 70. It also added Adventure Mode, where players could complete bounties for rewards in every region of the map. Reaper of Souls reviewed well and sold almost 3 million copies in its first week. And a new army of the dead. Another DLC pack released for Diablo 3 in 2017. Rise of the Necromancer's biggest feature was the introduction of the, you guessed it, Necromancer class, and not much else. Its release coincided with a free patch that introduced challenge rifts and new bounties to the game, but still, people were pretty cheesed off that they had to shell out $15 for a character class with no new story content to go along with it. BlizzCon, we love Diablo. During the BlizzCon 2018 opening ceremony, Wyatt Cheng took to the main stage to talk about the future of Diablo. Fans eagerly anticipating a new mainline entry were surprised to hear that the next game would actually be a free-to-play mobile and PC title called Diablo Immortal. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? <laughs> to Blizzard's credit, they had tried to preempt the announcement by telling people not to raise their hopes too much, but when has that ever stopped the internet from overreacting to things? Co-developed with NetEase, a Chinese company that published a number of Blizzard games in China, including Diablo 3, Diablo Immortal was poised as a full-fledged action RPG set between Diablo 2 and 3. Our reviewer Alessandro Barbosa praised the game's touch controls, how it looked, and how it evolved the Diablo formula, but criticized the late-to-end-game content, where progression would slow significantly, necessitating paying for the best in-game items using real-world money. One such player, YouTuber JT is all business, spent $100,000 on in-game items, but found out very quickly that it's lonely at the top. He tried to find a PvP match between 48 and 72 hours and couldn't find anyone to play. Blizzard eventually issued a fix. Despite criticisms of its microtransactions, Diablo Immortal earned $100 million in its first eight weeks. In November 2022, Activision Blizzard ended its long-term partnership with NetEase, suspending game services in mainland China. A NetEase executive even publicly wrote on his LinkedIn that the relationship broke down due to a jerk at Activision Blizzard. Blizzard games such as World of Warcraft and Overwatch are no longer able to be purchased in the country, but Diablo Immortal, which was covered by a separate agreement, is still available. Which brings us to Diablo 4. After Immortal's less than successful reveal at BlizzCon 2018, Blizzard pulled out all the stops at 2019's show, offering the first look at the brand new entry in the series with a distinctly dark and gory trailer featuring the game's big bad. Lilith. Set 30 years after Reaper of Souls, the demon Lilith has been summoned to Sanctuary, and in classic Diablo fare, it's your job to take her out. The biggest changes to Diablo 4 include its open world, and after it didn't meaningfully materialize in Diablo 3, PvP. Its overworld can be freely explored, and after completing the story, is even shared with other players online, meaning that you might see others running around and completing public events, like boss fights. Also, after completing a certain amount of the game, you get access to a mount, which makes traversing around much easier. Our reviewer Alessandro Barbosa gave it an 8 out of 10, saying, Diablo 4 at this time cannot escape comparison to the past of the franchise it belongs to. 
but it's thankfully a game that has been crafted with a strong awareness of what made each one either revered or reviled. It represents a measured approach to combining the many elements from previous entries that worked into a system that feels like the new standard bearer for action role-playing. We have plenty more on Diablo 4 right here on GameSpot, so make sure you tune in to check it all out. Thank you so much for watching, I'm on Twitter at LucyJamesGames, and I'll see you next time for more History Of.